yet. Good morning, sunshine. Look like a baby when you're asleep, Dad. So relaxed and content. No worries. Sleep in if you like. I'm not going anywhere. I'll be right here when you wake up. It's what I do. Oh, Danny boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling. From glen to glen and down the mountainside. The summer's gone and all the roses falling. Tis you, tis you must go and I must buy. But come ye back when summer's in the meadow. O'er all the valleys hushed and white with snow. Tis I'll be here in sunshine or in shadow. Oh, Danny boy, oh, Danny boy, I love you so. You look so peaceful when you're asleep, Dad. I've been meaning to tell you something, Dad. It's been on the tip of my tongue for three decades. I haven't been able to figure out how to get it out of my mouth. You gave me so many wonderful experiences as a kid. That trip to Amsterdam, dance lessons, water skiing. I was lucky. The problem was I had no idea how lucky I was. It took an unhappy marriage to bring me to my senses. I crawled right inside of Darren's family like a tortoise in a shell, carrying around an unbearable weight. That's what it took for me to know how good you were, Dad. I'm sorry I didn't see it sooner. I thought I'd marry into a family that was kinder or better somehow. It wasn't until I was 40 that I realized just how wrong I was. <laughs> you could sure get passionate about things. <laughs> oh yes, it terrified me until I got you. You stood up for what you believed in. You weren't afraid to show what you cared about. I didn't understand that for years. Thank you for being my dad. I'd take you over anybody. You've been a caring grandfather for Simone and the best she could ever have asked for. Please know that. She could never have gotten that love from anyone but you. Oh, Danny boy, the stream flows cool and slowly, and pipes still call and echo across the glen. Your broken mother sighs and feels so lonely, for you have not returned to smile again. So if you've died and crossed the stream before us, we pray that angels met you on the shore. And you look down and gently you'll implore us to live so we may see your smiling face once more. Once more. 
Say, Dad, guess what? I brought your old ski rope. Look, here it is. Remember this old blue thing? Would you like to go for a ski? Good. I thought you would. Strap on those skis and let's go for a spin around the lake. We're heading out across the beach towards Maple Bay. The lake is like glass today, isn't it, Dad? <laughs> now we're turning alongside the lake road and heading to the north side of the lake. It's always a bit windier over here. Hold on there, Dad. Hold on. <laughs> That's it, Dad. I see you cutting across the wake on your slalom ski. A oh, beautiful cut. We're heading over open water now, across the Needle Point on the other side of the lake. Ah, oh, that always felt like the most open place in the world when you took me skiing. The place of all possibilities. Can you feel the breeze and the water splashing on your legs? Yes, you are skiing again, my dad. <laughs> Driving into the waves, warping the ski handle. Oh, I see you're patting your head. Back to shore we go. And there you go. You let go of the rope and glide into the shore. Beautiful ski you had there. Now, how was that, Dad? Did you have a good ski? Good. You always did love the water. Are you going to stay in there and go for a swim now? I used to think you forced me to ski. You were testing my strength against the wake, getting me ready for the rough waters I'd have to get through. But you gave me some practice and I'll make it. I'll make it, Dad, because you taught me how. No rope, no boat, no skis now, Dad. Just you and the water. It's funny how the first version is the one that's remembered. It doesn't matter if it's the truth or uh, entirely fabricated or a little bit of column A and column B. Whichever one gets out first is normally the one that you're inclined to believe. They detained me. By the time I got to tell anybody, nobody would believe me. It's not right. None of this is right. So I'm gonna tell you what happened. You can believe me if you want to or not, I don't care. I'll admit I'm not an angel. I never was an angel. But what I did was totally justified. You ever been hungry? <laughs> like, not You've only had coffee for breakfast and you're trying to make it to lunchtime without passing out. No, I mean genuinely starving, hallucinatory levels of hunger. Like you haven't eaten in five days and even then you had like half a donut that you found in the garbage, which made you sick because you didn't eat for two days before that. That kind of hunger. And you don't have a place to sleep. You just have the grass, which is fine in the summer. Yeah, in the summer you can just forget who you are. But when that autumn chill comes in, and it's rainy all the time, and the frost is about to come, the grass loses its appeal. I'll confess to this right now. <laughs> they thought that I randomly targeted them. I knew 
them. Even if they didn't know me, and, and I don't know if they genuinely didn't know me or if they were saying that for their own reasons. I don't know which is worse. Do you know who I am? Do you recognize me? Did you know who I was before I broke into your house? Before I stole from you? Did I exist for you? Or was I just some shadow on the street that didn't even register because we're like totally different species? Aren't we? It was a few weeks ago. I had just found a new spot, but it's in a high traffic area. And that's when I first saw them. They always passed me in the morning in the same direction and then back the other way later on in the day. The father, the mother, and the kid. <laughs> and this is why I know that they were lying when they said they didn't recognize me. The mom always gave me this dirty look like how dare I be this unfilthy person on her lovely way to wherever the hell they were going. The father didn't make eye contact with me. The one day that he did, he snarled at me like, like he bared his teeth. And that was terrifying. But worst of all was the kid. He wasn't above laughing and spitting at me. You know, he used to take the coins out of my hat and a couple times he kicked me. But I didn't do anything. I didn't fight back. What was the point? With his mom that close to me? You know what kind of trouble that can cause. So one day, on their way to wherever they were going, I followed them. I don't think that they knew I was there. I, I don't think so, but I followed them into the woods and they came to this beautiful clearing where there are huge houses on acres of land and it was nice. It was really nice. And that's when I noticed that the upstairs window was open. I was leaving to go find a bed. What if they leave that window open all the time? That was my inn. So the next day, they passed me at my spot, and I waited for them, and then I booted it into the forest. <laughs> and sure enough, there at their cottage, their freaking mansion, the window. I don't know how I got up there. There was a tree and somehow I must have channeled my inner squirrel or something. But I got up that tree and onto the roof and through that window. It was insane. I had no idea that bears could amass that much wealth. I guess if you're gonna hibernate that much of a year, you want it to be a nice place. I get this. So the window took me into a bathroom. There's a bear shitting in the woods joke there somewhere. I just can't find it. <laughs> But anyways, so I'm starving as usual, so I make it my way down to the kitchen. And there's their half-eaten breakfast. Bears eat porridge. I mean, who knew? <laughs> it was disgusting, the amount of waste that they left sitting there. And there were two big bowls, and so I tried them all. And one of the bowls was too hot, and one of those bowls was too cold. Like, how does that even happen? The pot was on the stove. Do they heat up? Did the father use a microwave? Do bears use microwaves? Uh, is that racist? Anyway, there was a third bowl that was smaller and it was warm and it had milk and honey and it was so good. So I ate it all. Cut, sorry. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Lord me. Okay, uh, so I ate it all. Okay, I'm gonna go back from, so I ate it all. Okay. So I ate it all. I think maybe it was a little bit yummier just because I knew that it belonged to that jack wad of a kid of theirs. <laughs> they had nice furniture. When I say nice furniture, I mean like, it was nice looking. Thank you. The big chair, the dad's, was so hard. I might as well have been sitting on concrete with my back against a wall. I mean, not totally out of my realm, so. But I need a little bit 
something more. The medium-sized chair, the mommy bears, was like made of cotton candy or something. No lumber support whatsoever. And, and again, I need something, a little bit more support, you know? So again, it was the kids that was the best. It was a cute little easy rocking chair, which yes, was broken when I left, but I mean, come on, what kind of chair can support a small bear, but not a normal sized human being? Cut. Now, I'm not suggesting that the evidence was tampered with at all, but... I, okay, totally. It, I'm totally suggesting that. But I'd like to see them prove that I did anything to that chair. After failing, obviously miserably, with sitting, I went upstairs. There were two bedrooms. I mean, that's nuts. It was a three-occupant home with three bedrooms? Why do they need this? So I went into the first room, the father bear's bedroom. It was scary as fuck. He had this painting of a guy, a human being in full colonial hunting gear. I kid you not, with literally one of those big ass hunting rifles. I mean, I'm surprised that I didn't see a stuffed human head hanging on the wall. Maybe if I went in the basement or something, I don't know. But the bed was hard, like concrete. I mean, I should have known that Papa Bear liked his things a certain way. Mama Bear's room was creepy, like in a Stepford Wives kind of way. I swear her bed was stuffed with just down. It was like lying on clouds, which I guess would be nice for some people, but again, I need a little bit of support. Come on. Baby Bear's room was fine. There was no decoration. It was more like, like a hotel room or a hospital room. The bed was perfect. You know what happened next? Well, you do. You've heard it. Imagine not sleeping in a proper bed for six months and what cool, soft sheets feel like on your skin and having a full belly for the first time in so long and and you'll know why I fell asleep for eight hours. And then I woke up to screams and snarls and being attacked by animals. Animals is what did this to me. They were animals. I also might have pocketed a bit of Mama Bear's jewelry. I mean, in all fairness, what does a bear need with earrings and a gold necklace? I mean, come on. Look at me. They did this to me. They found me in their home. Is this justified? me. All I wanted was a place to sleep and some food to eat. And their snarling little kid spat at me for weeks. So I ate his porridge. All I wanted was a warm meal. And now I'm the one that's being punished. I can't, I can't afford a lawyer. I don't even have a fixed address. What was I supposed to do? It wasn't legal. But I can't go with legal. Was it justified? It wasn't right. I know it wasn't right. But it was just right.
first the yellow, then the blue, and the pink. First the yellow, then the blue, then the pink. She said, first the yellow, then the blue, then the pink. But I like blue better than yellow. And so it should come first, but it doesn't. The yellow comes first. That's what she said. Remember, the yellow comes first, even though you like the blue better, much better than yellow. Remember, the yellow comes first, and then the blue, and then the pink. It makes sense that pink comes last because I don't like pink. Inside the body, it's pink. When, when they pulled out that little bit of tissue for the biopsy, I thought it would be black or green blotted. Like those um, pictures of lungs in doctor's office, sis. But it wasn't black or green, it was pink, pink and glistening and healthy looking, longing to live. Nope, I don't like pink. It's pushy. And pink is last, but blue is not first, even though I like blue best. First is yellow, then blue, then the pink. Even inside the bodies of cats is pink. Or at least the bits that come out with the kittens is pink. Even if the kittens are dead. There's pink stuff, strands, membranes, and the mother licks and eats. And if she is too young, a mother, uh, she may deliver too early and the kittens can't survive and are dead. With pink stuff on them. She will lick them and even eat them. Small pink paw by small pink paw. No, I don't like pink, but pink is last, so I don't have to worry about pink. She said to think of the sun. And that comes up first in the morning. And the sun is yellow. So yellow goes first. But it's night before morning. And night skies are dark, which is closer to blue. And so blue should go first. And yet, still yellow must go first. She said if blue goes first, it, it won't work. She said I used to write, but she didn't say what I wrote. She said, you must remember that time when you had to go on and you never liked going on. Go on. Go on. Once there was a girl with brown hair who ran into her room because she had purple circles on the insides of her thighs and red stains on her white underwear. She knew that one day soon she was supposed to have red stains on her underwear, but she also knew that those stains came from something coming out of her, not something being shoved in her. She took the white underwear with red stains and scrubbed them and scrubbed them. She didn't 
no, you shouldn't use hot water to wash out blood. She didn't know that hot water makes blood set. She just knew she wanted to burn it out. No matter how hard she scrapped, they always remained pink. Forever. Pink betrays you. You can't hide from pink. I used to have eggs in the morning. And yolks are yellow, so yellow goes first, but eggs aren't good for you anymore. And so now I eat oatmeal in the morning, and oatmeal is kind of gray, which is closer to blue. So blue should come first. But that's not what she said. She said, First the yellow, then the blue, then the pink. All of it. I hate the writing. I hate the the documentation. I hate the all of the little obsessive compulsive tracking of my Carl Young footnotes. I'm just so. Ugh. 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 Okay, pulling back. I can tell. I can tell. I'm I'm definitely stuck in stage five. All the paranoia, the compulsion, the repetitive behaviors. But truly, no matter how irritating they think I am, there's no arguing with my results. It may seem like a simple circle, the Mandela. Almost a child's drawing, but they can't argue with what I've accomplished with this little easy circle. Those Mandelas, now if they were being honest with themselves, oh, those doctors wise. <laughs> But not if they're open to seeing the illuminating underlying structure right here of ev everything. It may seem like a simple circle, but it can encompass it can encompass the world. When I look at a Mandela, it's like I, I'm it's like I'm reading a printout of what the patient is revealing, conscious and subconscious, everything. I I know it's a gift. I do, and it's. It's not like a gift from the universe or some divine sense. It's, it's based on years of experience, you know? It's based on thousands and thousands of Mandelas. I, I pick up a Mandela and it's, it's like the person's just telling me. I don't even have to see that person. I, I just know. I, I read the Mandela. I read it like an x-ray. The meaning is just reflected in the work. A shift in my own consciousness almost a sense of becoming one with the Mandela. It's like a, like a catalyst of my own organism. <sighs> Emotions are aroused, thoughts, images, they intrude their empathy for the organism represented by the Mandela is, is transgendered. Oh, listen to me with that, jeez, arrogance of that past voice. <laughs> But looking at the Mandela, you don't see the damage directly, but it, it's inferred. Like, like a radiologist reads an x-ray, inferred from the presence or absence of, of the shapes, of lines, of colors, re relationships. Continuing to explore to open up avenues of inquiry, 
in those that are just open to healing. Why don't they like me? Is it because I'm Catholic? God, those... Not a doctor's wife. Just during my time at the hospitals. You know, some of the nurses actually accused me of going into some of the... Uh, some of the patient's files. Can you believe it? <laughs> How can you know this? It's like ESP. Are you psychic? I mean, it's the 70s, you know? God, tune in. Tune on. Drop out. Maybe it's just because I'm a woman. They grandfathered me into the AATT, American Art Therapy Association, the other day. God, I almost threw it back in their faces. I suspect they want to keep the, the Maverick Camels right inside the tent. They were just awfully tired of me pissing all over it. But when they asked me to quantify it, objectify it, how can I teach that? It's like, it's like if I'm a mother, of course I'm a mother, but if I were the mother of a child, like a little girl, and I'm, I'm talking to the doctor because she's sick. You might ask, an, a non-mother might ask, how do you know if she's sick? And I, I try to quantify it, I, the subconscious clues of, well, well, perhaps her ears are red. I know she's always sick when her ears are red, but it is not because of conscious knowing. So I take her to the doctor and the doctor says, oh yeah, she's definitely sick, oh yes, yeah. Oh, I can prove it with this lab report, you know, this lab report, now it's objective. But maybe the doctor only asked for that lab report because of his own instinct, a gut feeling, talking with me, talking with our sick little girl about her red ears, a feeling like he always gets when he's working with a sick patient. That's why he even asked for the lab reports in the first place. So now the line between subjective and objective knowing wavers, it's a movable feast. But it's not the objective they want for my thesis. <laughs> the, no. They want the justified, the dissected, the, the analytical explanation of how I interpret the meaning of a Mandela. But in the end, it's just like the doctor, it's the mother we can only fall back on our own private experience. I remember the first time I started out in the psychiatric ward. <laughs> Wickoff and Patterson, New Jersey. Wickoff was long-term patient, heavily medicated. They didn't really recognize even the idea of art therapy 10 years ago. Now, I created my own job. I heard about Anyway, I went on to the hospital with my arts portfolio and asked, and he said, oh, you can just start right here. Well, you're not going anywhere. You're going to stay right here. I'll introduce you to people who will be helpful. And you'll get all the information that you need. You just come here. You will not work with the other auxiliary volunteers. <laughs> You will not work with all the auxiliary volunteers, but in the occupational theory department directly under me. I wonder now. Art therapy in hospitals is a group activity. I'd have maybe 15 people at any one session for two or three hours. Emergency conditions, referral by the attending physician, meet medications, the rule rather than the exception, you remember, with all those handicaps, I had to work out an approach, make it into a ritual. I'd pass out the art supplies, taking out the role of art making in, in other cultures. Carl Jung found his patients would spontaneously paint Mandela's at a certain stage of their therapy, but I always passed out paper plates, talking about circular form. I wasn't teaching a skill. I wanted to give them the opportunity to begin early. 
you know, if the Mandela is the answer, then... But if their choice, of course, whatever is produced in an art therapy situation is acceptable. And it's seven... And then the room gets very quiet. An atmosphere conducive to inner work is taking hold. I'm talking softly of the sacred nature of the Mandela, that they're spinning it, as it were, out of their own flesh. I talk of rose windows, of stone temples, of healing ceremonies, of how I can center the energies, a, a visual prayer to the higher self. It's like a road, a pathway that you are building as you walk, carrying the stones laboriously, one at a time. The road comes into being beneath your feet. It's a, it's a process. It's it's just a process. It's a it's just simply a process. You know, you keep telling me. Well, I keep telling myself. If I can teach someone my Mandela theory, which I've, I've proved that I can do, then I should be able to write it down, you know, publish it, codify it. When Groff first asked me to come to Maryland, his famous LSD studies, people would ask me if I could read minds. <laughs> like that woman in my class looking at her Mandela and asking if she was pregnant, you know. Something gynecological going on? Even before she told her husband, before she even knew herself. They make magical assumptions. What are you doing, Mandela's? How interesting. Can you really see something there that you have no other way of knowing? Oh my God, you're right. This can't be. This, this, this must be dangerous. I, I try to show them. I mean, it's, it's one of the most promising areas of insight into psychosomatic illness research. We should be looking at the patterns that turn up constantly in a particular disease, like, like cancer. I get so tired, so tired, it's trying to rest the attention of the rest of the world. My umbrella might be art therapy, but I don't see myself as a therapist. I'm interested in the product. I always have been. And what the product will do. You, you can't learn from heavily medicated patients. They're, they're suspended. Highs and lows blunted down by the medications. No, I am interested in the product. And if the medication interferes with that, then the telephone that I'm using to connect with, I, it interferes with that product. The, the nuance of color, you know, of form, it can be totally lost on a treatment team. Gah! The primary process was readily available to me. I obviously had never unlearned it. I responded immediately to the visual information, almost as if I were just reading off a printout, a, a lab report. It is so clear. I didn't actually understand how I got it, which particular line or color conveyed a specific fact, but there it was, right in front of me. There are no rules written on the wind. I just, I know my conclusions have been right. Right. So my task has been to work backwards. Reading, contemplating, teasing out the clues that I was using intuitively enormous quantities of material, just trying to weave it like, all together here. But it was during those early years that I stayed awake at night for hours. I still have all the old scratch pads I'd fooled around with in the middle of the night just trying to figure things out, working through stage three. Then people ask me, why the great round? Why do you arrange your 12 stages in a circle? A circle of circles? I mean, really? But nothing is accidental. We choose from our environment those symbols we most resonate with. I came to Young's work on Mandela's at a time in my life when I felt overly extended 
I was seeking consolidation. So my choice was the circle, the Mandela, a symbol of wholeness. I could not imagine there not being an order. But I'm like a flyer who learned by the seat of his pants. Not the ivory tower. I never went to school for this. I committed the ultimate crime of going to Antioch for an MA in psychology rather than to one of those new art therapy programs. I'm neither fish nor fowl. I have no sorority. It's all simply experience. Hands-on, boss, and cleaning lady all at the same time. Art therapists have their own agenda. I don't know. Sticking silver foil on paper or something. It's, it's a great tool. We should show you how to do it. You cut it up and you glue it. Oh, it's wonderful. And you get the whole family involved. And I think, oh God, deliver me. <laughs> and then I start to question. My own purpose in starting in Antioch was to write up, try to document, to, to share my methods for those interested in art and, and psychology. Now my goal isn't so clear. No society is without faults, and our society is not exceptional. The ethical considerations of yet another tool, another way to pry into the pre-consciousness of, of individuals. Oh, God. Does the world really need another tool to label people? The diagrams of misuse far outweigh any personal satisfaction I may gain from publishing my... But... Each time I'm gone into a new clinical setting with my Mandela's, my art supplies, the question is always, Mandela's? What? And why aren't you using the tried and true projective instrument developed by Rorcher. Oh my God. Rorcher. A young Swiss man obsessed as a teen with an ink blot game tested on a couple hundred? Really? I mean, really? Okay, let's dissect this. He was young. I'm not. He's European. Swiss, even. He's male. And it's the most popular assessment used throughout the United States. Not standardized, no agreement on interpretations, the patients not interacting, just looking. It's so unidimensional. I go back like a talisman. Each and every Mandela is a product of a specific individual in a specific setting at a specific time. It's unique. It, the problems, the joys, affect, amount of physical energy, that everything. I reflect in the Mandela, which can be viewed as a, a bird's eye view, a hologram, or a worm's eye view, maybe a, a concrete approach. It's... It's interesting to reflect on my own process, my ambivalence about publishing the material. I have moved out of stage five, the retentive state with accompanying paranoid feelings about the use to which others may put this work. Now I've moved to the next stage and will hopefully move on. The present stage is number six, the split circle, shadow and self. The confrontation of opposites, the dragon flight, like the pain of cracking open the ego, the adolescent releasing from his parents. I should know. Whatever use the world makes of one's darling, however hostile the world, it, it must be done. If we as a society are committed to the wisdom of sharing knowledge rather than retaining it for the precious few elite, then our salvation is linked with open access to scientific knowledge. Not tucking it, hoarding it in a recreational department. So I will move on to the squaring of the circle, stage seven. I will share the responsibility with all in the field of psychology. Hope that it's used with compassion. 
We need to keep the circle moving. But I welcome you to join me. Life keeps moving the stones beneath us. In any case, it is a moving experience. It is living. It's life. Hungry? I took my time getting downstairs. My walker has wheels and I'm afraid of falling. But the man was still there when I reached the front door. Good afternoon, ma'am. I'm Andy Love from the Love Foundation Ministries and I'm wondering if I could have a few moments of your time. He was very well mannered. Of course, I said, won't you come in? Thank you so much. He seemed slightly surprised to be invited inside. I hobbled toward the living room with Mr. Love behind me. I represent the Love Foundation Ministries, a spiritual fellowship that brings divine love to the hearts of millions. We sponsor As the World Burns and The Old and the Dutiful, dramatic daytime television on the Love Network. Oh, yes, I'd heard about these shows, although I hadn't seen them. Through these critically acclaimed programs, we teach millions of viewers the wages of sin and the glory of redemption. Um, hum, I said, but these television dramas are expensive to produce, and so we rely on viewers like yourself to help us continue to spread our sacred message. Wait right here, Mr. Love. I limped and rolled to the kitchen where I put cookies on a plate and poured a glass of the milk I keep on hand to help me sleep. Then I returned to the living room. Please eat something. Your work must make you hungry. Why, thank you. Mr. Love seemed thrilled with his further hospitality. He bit into a cookie and gulped down some milk. This is very kind of you. My pleasure, I said. Now you were saying... We go from door to door, asking good people to help us spread the word. We ask for whatever folks feel comfortable giving. Well, I said, I don't have a lot, but I could write you a check. Why, that would be wonderful, Mr. Love looked truly pleased. We're really very grateful for whatever you can do. It's believers like yourself who make our holy work possible. He raised his half-empty glass in a toast to believers and down some more milk. I paused, then said, I, I keep my checkbook in the basement. You never know whom to trust, so I hide it downstairs. Mr. Love took this little confession in stride. Right, he said. He nodded wisely. Better safe than sorry. Could I ask you to get it? It's in the cardboard box at the foot of the stairs. I motioned toward the basement door off the kitchen. Why, certainly, I'd be happy to retrieve it. Mr. Love was positively glowing. We both got up and headed toward the door. I pulled it open and flipped the basement light switch. Watch your step, I warned. Mr. Love groped the railing at the top of the stairs. Then his knees buckled. The narcotic in the milk had taken effect. I gave him a push, shut the door behind him, and turned the bolt in the lock. After he woke up, he yelled for two days. It's day five now, and things are pretty quiet. But I've been watching as the world burns and enjoying the show. As for the old and the dutiful, I just couldn't get into it. I'm falling! Does anybody hear me? I could really let myself go. 
with just a little effort. That's about all I could do with a little effort. Hey! Doesn't anybody see me? Am I just another crippled liver in your streets? Another tortured human being you hope will disappear? Like the roaches in your sinks or the rats in your hallways? I know, I know, I'm just another story. And not the greatest ever told. I'm an impediment. A reminder of your holiday depression you fight off so desperately with your busy shopping. Stop! Just a minute. You, out there. Look at my eyes. They're just the same as yours, aren't they? Only I see what you don't want to see. I see death coming at us so fast we can't dodge it. And I'm not talking about war either, or city crime. Nothing big and bloody you can put off thinking about. Like a movie you saw on television. Hey, you. What do you think death is? Wait. Let me tell you. Death is a woman in curlers, in a blue chenille bathrobe, smoking her tenth cigarette. Well, she opens her mail. A couple of advertisements and Christmas cards from her bank and her dentist. Death is a lonely old guy trying to pick up a woman in a supermarket. Death is a woman in a blue bathrobe, dying alone somewhere in France. Death is a guy in a dirty white apron, walking in a crumby diner. Death is a woman staring at her dried up hands, wishing she had been so goddamn critical. Death is a woman running all the time, running through the city. Death is me in this wheelchair, now, and yesterday, and maybe tomorrow, and you. Death is all your fantasies and none of them. Oh, what the hell? Yeah. And if I do fall, will any of you help me? Sure, I know. Why should you? Are you my keeper, my brother, my sister? No, you don't know me. And life is so short, why should you care? But I don't think you know that, do you? About life being short. You think it's gonna go on forever? You can keep on sleepwalking, not paying any attention to what you're doing, to what you got I mean, in your hands now. Well, this little heartbeat is fluttering, fragile. Let me tell you a story. This is a good one, the kind you like. It's about falling, falling in love. You see? There was this girl named Kara. My God, was she beautiful. She was my darling, and her father's darling too. So I had to steal her. I had to win her from the castle. That wasn't hard, because I was a dragon. I was young and strong, and I had fire in my eyes and my mouth. You can't believe me, can you? Look at me now. That's well, the truth. My truth. Which is as good as anything you'll ever know. Kara was a princess. And she never met anyone like me. One night, she let down her golden hair and I climbed up. Well. You know the story. It was a wonderful night. And only the first of many nights. And then I took her away to the city. This city. And it was Christmas, just like now. And I said, Kara, my darling, do you believe in Santa Claus, in the Tooth Fairy, in your fairy godmother? Yes, she said. Breathy, you know, because she 
love me. And at times like that, you believe in anything. So I said, my love, you wait here. Because I have to go off and fight a little war, like we all do, you know? To win our manhood. But I'll be back, and we can keep on loving the way we do now. Nothing can stop us. I talked like that then because I had fire in my heart, and I was gloriously stupid. I said, Kara, my dear, You'll be protected by all these fantasy figures until I return. Glowing with wisdom and immortality. And then, I said, you wait. And I kissed all 10 of her fingertips. And I did. Other things, which I don't like to think about now. So leaving my faithful Kara behind, I went off to win the war. That's a joke. Oh, it's okay. You don't have to laugh. It wasn't a good one. Because as we all know, there wasn't anything to win. It wasn't a real war. But that's another story. The joke was ultimately on me, though. You see, when I got there, I did, well, you know, what we're all supposed to. I stopped. Looked and listened. And I heard the lies and saw all the crap, the atrocities. And I said, hey, wait a minute. I'm in the wrong movie. I'm not a dragon. I'm just a guy who suddenly doesn't care about his manhood at all. Not in this context. Sorry, they said. And we all know who they are, because we refer to them all the time. We're making this movie and you're in it, kid. <laughs> nope, I said. I'm shooting this one out. You can shoot without me. And being a real literal type of guy, I went and sat in a little hut, and I refused to move, to eat. You know the kind of things that went on. I even took off all my clothes because I didn't want to wear a uniform. Oh, I was a real honest guy. True to myself. Just like I was taught. <laughs> and now, <laughs> here comes the funny part. This is really crazy. <laughs> I'm sitting there in my little hut being real honest and peaceful with all the other guys out blown up villages now we don't care at this point if they wanted to or not that's where they were but not me <laughs> oh no I'm sitting there when zap this shell comes zooming along. <laughs> it blows my whole goddamn heart apart. Good one, huh? Real 
killer. Sometime later, somebody found me. Found pieces of me. Put some of them together. And folded me up all nice and neat and sent me home in a box. <laughs> you remember that old song? It's a good one. Not as memorable, maybe, as... I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. But good still. I sing it sometimes to Kara when I'm being real funny. Hey! Wait! Don't turn away. I'm not finished yet. And I know you. You're dying to find out what happened with me and my little Kara. <laughs> Me too. I'm dying to find out what happened. All I know is... I couldn't love her anymore. It wasn't just that I couldn't make love to her. I couldn't... love... She wouldn't! She won't! Leave me! Alone, she says. Which has a grim humor of its own, you'll have to admit. Because in a way, we're both gone. Nobody lives there anymore. I have these dreams that I'm falling through the city. A slow but endless fall. The whole city is burned out. Got it. Just charred structures. I'm falling through the Empire State Building. Down, down through old, once beautiful hotels and theaters. Down past that old billboard where the guy smoking Lucky Strikes is blowing smoke. Only now, only his mouth and the smoker left. I see Kara falling too. So sadly. From the city rises this this chant. It's a dirge, really. From the whole city. More than through its broken teeth, the death of love. And I reach out. See? I reach!
Powers of the East, be here now. Powers of the West, be here now. You know these roads, here at the crossroads where Hecate's hounds howl at night, a supper on her altar, a placation, an offering to the goddess at the darkening moon. The moon waxes waning, the way home is through the cave inwards into the darkness. Hear your cells transmute, cell by cell, like her supper decomposing on the altar. So you eat sparingly, with caution, measuring every morsel that enters your mouth because it will transform you. It will, truly, it will. So to the stars that enter the vacant interstellar places, promising you your destiny. And so your eyes drink in their darkness, the bulks in your mouth. Poets say, 
may arrive before you arrive. Time may come before it comes. Oh, blessed night, where is your mystery? I, blind Tiresias, seer and prophet, let me hear your oracle. Odysseus, grant me your sureness with arrow and bow. As I shun Cyclops' overweighed appetite, let Pelops serve me up dismembered to the gods. Let the gods feast upon my eyes, my fingers, my bones, that my body may atone for my transgressions. My goddess, why have you forsaken me? Hecate, hear my cries as you heard hers. For I am like Persephone, abducted into Hades' shades. I too have eaten pomegranate seed, corrupted her sacred fruit. I am lost. I am lost to the infernal compass that has measured our every shore. Cave and mountain in numbers foreign and fanciful. All length, depth, and height that philosophers have petrified into monoliths and eminent men of letters tamed for their personal heroism. I am writing blindly. I am writing in this gloomy silence. As I am writing on these stony walls, my fingers trace the craggy contours, the outline of all your stories coming before and after me. I am writing to you, queen of all that is unheard, unseen, and unsaid. To you, veiled sister, ancient hag, whose laws upheld the Nile, eternally fertile and green, whose torches blessed each seedling beneath dark, loamy earth. Tribal grandmother of the underworld, be the magnet for my compass, and like the tuning fork that tones, tone, vibrate unmind ferrous forms. shaping them into signs, ciphering all the stories of my unknown existence. Spell me a path, like Gretel's trail, lit sublunary, yet true. I come with shivering hand into the labyrinth. O Holy One, crone of the blessed crossroads, lead me. Lead me. Take me home.
unto her we shall return.